Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today. I do want to begin this conversation by asking you to respond to this Bloomberg headline uh, that is reporting that in the St. Petersburg Forum, President Putin has said that the country has transferred their first nuclear weapons to Belarus. What is your response to that? This is very, very serious situation. And by this gesture, by this step, he is destroying the what is rest. Uh, from the international law and agreements. If you remember, us, Moldova, both the Russians and Kazakhs were signing this Budapest memorandum that we were laying down the nuclear weapons. In return, we will be defended against anybody who can come to us. The Russians obviously did not respect this with us, but rearming Belarus, it's a gas, it, another, just another blood and violation of the international agreements. I believe that West have to take it very, very seriously. Does Ukraine view this as a sign, a warning perhaps from Vladimir Putin, a threat uh, that he could use nuclear weapons, possibly tactical nuclear weapons in the months ahead? I believe that he was blackmailing all of us, Ukrainians first of all, but then Europeans and Americans and all our, all our partners around the globe that at the end of the days, if he is cornered, he will use some, some, some ace, like in this case, the nuclear weapons. And that's what he's doing. He's bringing, or at least promising, to bring to Belarus. But I have to tell you that, you know, now we're much better equipped to withstand this pressure. With all these anti-air missiles which we're receiving from our partners, we are downing everything, on, sometimes on a level of 100%. So he has to be extremely careful what he's planning, because who knows? If he sends something our way, it might not get to the point. Let me ask you about this counteroffensive. It appears we are now in week, at the end of week one or two of this counteroffensive. And it's unusual how mum Ukraine has been on any of the inroads that it may or may not have made at this point. Um, characteristically, and no surprise, Russia has been publicly claiming that Ukraine has not been successful thus far. Give us the current state of this counteroffensive. Obviously, everybody knew that we would come as soon as the uh, ground solid enough to withstand the heavy uh, Western tanks and our own tanks. It's not a big secret that we were waiting for the perfect moment. And I guess this perfect moment is, is right in front of us. It's not yet. We have not uh, engaged and committed all the forces we have. We are probing, trying to find the best place for the attack. The dam, which was destroyed by Russians, is changing our cards a bit. We have to replan our, replan our operation because the, the, the part of this huge thousand kilometers front is not accessible for the heavy equipment. So this is delaying our counteroffensive bit, but I guess the Russians have to wait just a couple of days more. So is it fair to say this is still the probing stage? Because we know that, that Ukraine hasn't committed the bulk of its forces yet. Uh, early gains that have been made are clearly not insignificant. But we have seen images uh, of damaged uh, U.S. Bradley armored vehicles, as well as Leopard tanks in this fighting already, suggesting that these heavier equipped, more sophisticated weapons are being used. This is true. We will never promise that we will come and go all the way without losing some tanks or very unfortunately some people as well. This is painful to see this tech, but at the same time, you've seen a couple of, of these pieces being repaired and returned back to the front lines, which means that there is no perfect solution. This uh, battle will, will cost us a lot. And whatever we are gaining is just preliminary sort of attacks, allowing us to understand and see. All of this has a very much a political meaning, a political value as well. I understand that expectations are high, but this is sometimes playing a very tricky game on us and our partners around the globe. We want them to be careful and patient with us. This is not the last counteroffensive we might have with Russia. Obviously, I also understand that the picturesque sort of uh, success will re-energize the assistance around the globe. That's what we need. If you want to have the return on investment into Ukraine, Maybe we have to, to increase this investment, give more tanks to allow us direct hit in a particular points we, we will find. 
You have made this point about being a bit frustrated with the level of expectations that have been set by many in the media and, and many uh, of Ukraine's supporters in terms of the significance of this counteroffensive, perhaps uh, setting the bar as high as what we saw around Kharkiv. Should people expect to see more of what happened around Kherson? And how worried are you at the possibility that continued support really hinges on the outcome of this specific counteroffensive? You know, even 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 Kherson operation is actually was quite successful because Kherson was the only significant city Russians managed to get from the very beginning of the war. So the 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 fact that they uh, sort of got back out of it, preserving their lives, is not bad until we are knowing that we are freeing our own lands. Our aim of this whole war is not to kill maximum Russian soldiers or kill the maximum Russian tanks is just to get them out of our land and then decide how we live with them for the centuries to come. So the Kharkiv operation, I agree with you, it was spectacular, the whole, that, but that Russians are also learning from their own mistakes. I guess this operation will allow them to dig really deep and then prepare their, their defenses. We have to be much smarter. We, we don't want to repeat their losses, which they had at the Bakhmut in round, when their tanks were just going through the lens, lens of mines and blowing them in a way. So that's what we have to avoid. We have to be much more sort of clever. It does appear that Russia appears to be more more competent in terms of defense as opposed to their offensive operations earlier in this year. How how much of a game changer would additional long uh, long range missiles and more F-16s or any F-16s at this point really exactly. be at this stage of the battle? First of all, the, the strength of any defensive forces is logistics. That's the, the, the trenches needed, the bunkers needed, the trained soldiers and the numbers of them are important. But actually, this is important how fast you're bringing the artillery shells to the, to the front lines and allowing your forces to shoot at their upcoming offensive. So that's what we're trying to resolve with, the, with uh, British rockets. We will need somebody else, our partners, to come, including the United States, with something which would allow us to target anything on our own territory. And that's the rockets. F-16s, you know, without the... That was the failure of Russian attack. They could not establish the air superiority over the whole period of, of, of war. The F-16s or any other uh, Western planes would allow us to, first of all, deny them from our skies and hopefully to establish our own superiority. By this moment, if we manage to do so, the war will, the fate of war will be resolved. Looking at the longer term goals here for Ukraine, obviously, uh, first and foremost, after defeating uh, Russia, would be to join NATO. And we have seen the defense chiefs uh, meet in Brussels yesterday. Uh, as far as alignment that NATO, that Ukraine will join NATO at some point in the future, they are all aligned uh, on that line. But when they will join, when Ukraine can join, is the big question mark here. And we don't really have a timetable, even set by President Biden. Uh, there does seem to be this alternative model that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing scenario, that, that Ukraine could go by way of Israel, perhaps, or even Taiwan, with not officially uh, joining um, any sort of membership or alliance, but getting all of the weaponry and supplies in order to protect itself. Would Ukraine settle for that right now? I believe that it's a bit uh, incorrect as a comparison, because Taiwan and Israel are not part of the sort of northern Atlantic region where Ukraine is. So I guess in a way, if Israel were, was closer, they would be in the alliance as well. So that was a decision which was done rather out of necessity and geographical necessity. So I, I would not expect our friends and partners to you know, invent something new and unique for Ukraine if we have such a proven mechanism and instrument as a NATO. And Ukraine was trying to get into alliance for years and years. I understand that for some of the members, it is difficult for their own reasons, but I guess the Ukraine is proving that it actually can be a donor of, the, of, of security in this particular region. We have the strongest army probably right now in Europe, and if we need somebody who was actually fighting with Russians, the only arch enemy of the NATO, that's Ukraine. So I don't believe that we will be happily uh, agreeing on some, something else rather than NATO. Our president is saying, yes, we need security guarantees, maybe on the, in the way of, of Israel or Taiwan, but that will be an interim solution until Ukraine will become the member of NATO.